welcome back to Hondo, the Hondo channel. So I put up a couple chapters of uh, the book that I wrote, and I'll probably finish it up eventually. I just want to do something different. So we're back to Finney, Charles Grandison Finney. What a name! When you pick up a systematic theology book, for 99% of the books you'll find. I mean, there's a lot of different systematic theologies. There's a lot of good ones. Um, I always think of Wayne Grudem. He's like the standard collegiate book these days. Um, Hodge has a really good set. It's three volumes. It's usually like 40 or 50 bucks. It's awesome. Um, of course, the Institutes of the Christian Religion. There's a lot. I, I don't want to talk about all of them right now. But anyway, what you find is that they always talk about Scripture. Scripture is first. Because you have to start somewhere. And you start by establishing that we believe the Bible, and however they establish it, you know, people like guys who will say, we believe the Bible because of evidence and reason. Or, or John Calvin was saying, we believe the Bible. We just do. We, we believe because the Holy Spirit tells us that it's true. And there can be no other authority. And then they go into theology proper, which is God the Father. And there might be later on a, a chapter on Christology after they go through all the attributes of God. And all, then they, and they talk about Jesus and everything that he did and his attributes and his works. Mainly it's about his work um, because his attributes are the same as the Father. And then they'll get into pneumatology, which is the Holy Spirit, and then eschatology, uh, ecclesiology, all these different branches of Christianity and Christian doctrine and theology. That's like 99% of all the systematic theology, because that is really what the Bible is about. God, his works, uh, Jesus, uh, all, this, all this stuff about the Holy Spirit, what he does, all this stuff. This is what makes sense, and this is really reasonable. But Finney, on the other hand, he starts with morality, moral government. What is morality? What is the moral law? First, of course, various classes of truths. How do we begin? Not scripture, but logic and reason. And, we, and I talked about this already. Two chapters on moral government. All about what is the moral law? Why do we hold to the moral law? Hardly anything about God. And he says himself, God is not the source of the moral law. Now let me read this to you and see if this makes any sense to any of you. Uh, page 21, moral law, as we shall see hereafter more fully, does not and cannot originate in the will of God. It eternally existed in the divine reason. So the divine reason and the will of God are two different things, but one of them the moral law flows from and the other one it doesn't. So God is like separated into two distinct entities. Or maybe he doesn't even believe that the divine reason comes from God. I have no idea what he's talking about. And then in the next page he says, Moral law is not a statute, an enactment that has its origin or foundation in the will of any being. So moral law does not come from God's will. It is the law of nature, the law which the nature or constitution of every moral agent imposes on himself and which God imposes upon us because it is entirely suited to our nature and relations. I think what he means by divine nature, okay, just hit me right now, is creation. Not the divine nature of God. Not the nature of God and who God is and, and his attributes and all that. But nature as created by God. So nature imposes a moral law on us and God. But the moral law doesn't come from God's will, even though nature came from God's will. So, again, this is basically insanity. Basically insanity. So this is Charles Finney. And so he doesn't say a lot about God. It's all philosophy, honestly. And this is what evangelists like, like Billy Graham, they just they cling to him. Because he brought in thousands had all this revival but we don't know and I'm gonna make a video about this later but we don't know exactly the nature of these 
salvations, these conversions, was genuine or whether it was how genuine could it be with this with this kind of theology behind it. So that's where he begins. He begins with his reason. He begins with his ideas of moral law. And again, God is subject to his own moral law. God has to adhere to the Ten Commandments, right? Just like us, because basically, and, and Finney says this, God is just a man just like us. We are just like God. And this is on page 12. And if you read this whole book, there is barely any need to believe in God. God does not give us strength. This is in his gracious ability chapter. God does not change our hearts. God does not regenerate us. God does not create the moral law. Even though he created creation, and the moral law comes from creation. I mean, if, if any man could be said to be a a diligent imbecile. It is Charles Finney. I mean, he was a hard worker. Lots of words here. And and I've when I read this, I was just dumbfounded. I was just completely stunned. This is on page 12, where he compares God's mind to our mind. And he says, if you study our mind, meaning psychology, he says psychology, then you will understand God's mind, because we are created in his image. So basically, we are just copies of God, and our mind is identical to His. And when we study our own mind, we will know God's mind. Theology is so related to psychology that the successful study of the former without a knowledge of the latter is impossible. Every theological system and every theological opinion assumes something as true in psychology. So all theology has some basis or some truth that it holds or depends on from psychology. Theology is to a great extent the science of mind in its relations to moral law. God is a mind or spirit. All moral agents are in his image. So he's just like us because we're just like him. So that was the things that he that he begins with. God is basically just there and who knows what he even does. And men are not sinners. Men do not need God's grace to be holy. Um, he says in this chapter on moral depravity that it is not possible that men are morally depraved in our nature because that would exclude both sin and the possibility of righteousness because it must be from us. It must come from our will that is free. If the will is not free then there is no capacity for righteousness. We can't be a moral agent if we can't choose one or the other. It's like sin has nothing to do with God's will, with offending God. It just has to do with breaking the moral law and doing it willfully when we have the ability to keep it at the same time. If all we do is break the moral law, it doesn't matter. That's not sin because we can't do anything else. But, and then he goes so far as to say, if, if you lose all capacity for understanding morality, then the moral law has no hold over you, has no obligation on you. Meaning, and he says, if you become an idiot, an imbecile, or a mentally retarded person, you can't sin, because your choice is gone, your freedom is gone. Page 326, suppose one had by the abuse of his intellect lost the use of it and become a perfect idiot, meaning a mentally challenged or mentally retarded person. Could he by any possibility be still required to understand and obey God? Certainly not. If you're born an idiot, you go to heaven. You can't sin. It's not possible because you're not a moral agent. And again, moral agency has to do with the ability to choose or not choose righteousness, morality. And then he says, if you're in hell, you have to be able to please God. Even if you're burning in hell, you have to, there must be the possibility that you trust in God. Otherwise, you're not a moral agent. 
in the eternal world and in hell, men and devils must necessarily assume their own freedom or ability to obey God as a condition of their obligation to do so and consequently of their being able of sin or holiness. Since Revelation informs us that men and devils continue to sin in hell, we know that there also must be assumed as a first truth of reason. Not that not the scripture scripture doesn't say this. Again, he's not basing what he's saying on scripture, but on a conclusion that he derives from a first truth of reason. It must also be assumed that they are free agents in hell, demons and men, or that they have the natural ability to obey God. So why wouldn't they? If they're burning in hell, why wouldn't they? Why wouldn't they repent? Because God's grace is no longer available to them. But Finney, Finney doesn't care about any of anything that the scripture says.